Uh, thank you so much to those of you who have joined us today. Uh, this uh, program on negotiations, I think, remains one of our most um, highly uh, popular of our returning professional development workshops. So we are very grateful to Jim Dahl uh, for coming back and speaking with our group today. And we look forward to hearing your presentation. Jim Dahl has over 30 years of higher education experience as faculty and administration. He has taught a variety of undergraduate and graduate courses in areas of management and leadership. Uh, and he is um, actually not an Illinois alum, but he's married to one. So I guess that gives him a little bit of cred, but we're always happy to see our colleagues here uh, from who, uh, who uh, engage with us from the Geese College of Business. I know we have many Geese students amongst our intern population. So uh, thank you so much for being with us today, Jim. And I will turn it over to you to talk about effective negotiations. Thanks so much. Well, Laura, thank you for the introduction. And I'm also pleased to say that one of my three children are also a graduate of Illinois. So it's always fun to have those Illinois connections. Um, I'm really looking forward to this uh, topic and presentation. It's one of my favorite topics when I talk and teach management. Uh, so I'm looking forward to it. Uh, let me kind of jump in and kind of get set the stage for us. We'll get into the material and hopefully we'll have a very uh, fruitful conversation. Um, for any presentation that lasts about an hour, my goal is I hope you have one or two takeaways that you can think about or think differently about uh, and know that that may shape the way you then approach negotiations. So that's kind of uh, the goal for today. So with that, um, let's just kind of jump into it kind of how we want to play today in the sandbox. Uh, please share, uh, please engage. Uh, if you can, video on. If you're eating lunch, certainly I understand. You can turn the video off. Uh, obviously, the uh, mute the mics. Questions at any time, please try to use chat or just ask. Just open up your mic and ask. I have no problem there. Uh, if you raise your hand, I don't always see it. So it's actually a little bit easier to throw it up in chat or uh, just open up the mic. So with that, let's get going. So uh, we're going to do uh, things of three. So we're going to do three thought exercises, three steps in planning negotiations, and three key negotiation behaviors. Again, I want you to walk away with a couple of takeaways. Hopefully, this will provide you with a couple of those takeaways. And threes seem to be a nice way to organize material. So let's do an exercise. This is the thought exercise. Uh, indeed, there's now a $20 reward or uh, for the employee of the month for the month of June as we come up to the end of the month. But we're going to do this in a different way and think about a little bit of negotiations. So it's going to go to two people. Person A is going to propose how to divide the $20, to $20 between the two parties and person B will accept or reject that offer. So like any negotiation, there's a proposal and there's an acceptance or rejection. Here are the rules. If accepted, the money's allocated. If the proposal is rejected, the funds are returned and no one gets any money. Okay, so that's the thought exercise. So put yourself in, uh, in this space for just a minute or two. Okay, $20, divvied up. Person A is gonna propose how to divvy it up. Person B gets to accept or reject. If it's rejected, the money goes back. If accepted, the, it is uh, implemented accordingly. So now you got that thought in going on a little bit. What would you propose if you're a person A? Throw this up in chat. You're gonna propose, you got $20 to divvy up between you and person B. What would you propose? Go ahead and throw that up in chat. Ten, 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 splitting half, 19-1. Okay, any other others? Person B gets 12, it depends. Excellent. Uh, I'm gonna ask, uh, and if you don't mind, I'll call out your name and if you don't wanna share, that's fine. But if you do, I'd appreciate it. Uh, Deanna, what, it depends on what? Now that you threw that out there for us. Yep, this is just an award for the best employees. So that's that's uh, kind of a free gift from the company. Abdul, you said person B gets $12. Talk to me about that, if you don't mind. Uh, yeah, I feel like um, even though they might get 20 if they get the whole thing, but 
the fact that they're getting a little bit more than me gives them a perception that um, they're better off this way. Okay, so if you're proposing it, you're going to propose that you get $8 and person B gets $12. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, fair enough. Cello uh, 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 Martinez, uh, 19 for A and one for B and you're person A. So why 19 for you and $1 for person B? I was getting greedy. <laughs> <laughs> I thought the person might uh, take whatever I might give them. All right, so they may take whatever you give them. Okay, now let's just flip this a little bit. Your person B, person A proposes $18 and for you, they've offered you $2. Are you gonna accept or reject? Throw it up in chat. Got it, one reject, two reject, three, four, five, six. Roger's got reject, Sophie's got reject. Looks like uh, we're getting a, a consensus here of rejects. I don't see anyone saying accept. Okay, let's think about this for just a minute. You walked into the space, <clears throat> you have an opportunity to walk out of this space with two more dollars in your pocket. If you eject it, you're getting zero. Now the rational model would say, well, accept whatever you're given, right? Because there's two more dollars than you had before. But we'll talk about why that's the case and why most of us would reject it. Uh, and Beth says, uh, Beth is kind of going against the current here and saying, yeah, I would take the $2, it's more than I had before, right? That's the rational model, right? In terms of rational decision-making, the Dr. Spockian way of thinking, right? Uh, so a couple of you said accept. So here's what the research shows. And by the way, whether it's $20 or $100, the research is consistent. It shows us this. If it's split about 50-50, close to 50-50, the majority will accept it. If it's less than 50-50, the majority will reject it. So uh, all of you who rejected, why did you reject? It was $2 more than you had before. So why did you reject it? Sense of inequity. That's a key variable there, right there. A sense of inequity, right? Did most of you say I reject because of a sense of inequity? Does that seem to be the case? Yep. So if he says yes, fair enough, yep. All right, so here's the point. We think we tend to think about negotiations as a very rational process, right? I make an offer, you make a counter offer, we go back and forth and we figure all this out. But in fact, the research is pretty consistent. We expect two things, fairness, which is one of these issues that you've just addressed here. And by the way, if I gave you $100 in this equation, not $50 or $20 and ask you to split it and the person proposed $80 and 20 for you. Again, the research would show most people would reject it even though it's 20 more dollars than they had before. And the other thing we expect in negotiations is reciprocity. I'm gonna make something really important about that. When negotiations happens, when someone makes an offer, we expect a counter offer and that counter offer then expects the first person to reciprocate somehow, right? You keep going back and forth until you land on a number. Please think about that because that is often used in negotiations for really effective negotiation, negotiators to actually kind of leverage how they use reciprocity so that you give in, okay? Counter that, when you do counter, you expect a reciprocity in return. Those are two huge behaviors uh, that we see, excuse me, emotions that we see in negotiations. In fact, negotiations are a big part of negotiations. So one of the things I want you to walk away from today is anytime you're in negotiations, not only is it an emotions like nervousness, like a negotiation for a salary or something, but it's also just an emotion of these expectations. We're going to be fair and we're going to reciprocate. Okay. Key here is fairness is in the eyes of the beholder. So we have to think about it from that perspective. Quick uh, example of that. <clears throat> Talk to someone who's owned a home for 30 years and they're selling it. The market will say the price of the house is worth $300,000, but they think it's worth more than that because they spent 30 years of investing in that house. And they think not only did that, they've invested in upgrades in the house and uh, making it look nice and all those things. And it's part of their attachment. That attachment alone increases the sense of value to the product, or in this case, the house, right? That's an emotion, okay? So we have to think about how emotions play into all of this. 
All right, so uh, thank you for sharing in chat. We'll do a couple more thought exercises. So the first takeaway here is think about how emotions are playing out in the process. So as I mentioned, uh, we need to think about our emotions, but we also have to think about their emotions, right? They're gonna expect reciprocity. So I have to re reciprocate or they will perceive it as unfair. So those are something we need to think about. But at the end of the day, emotions are a huge part of the decision we actually make about yes or no to a particular proposal, as was the case with this thought exercise. All right, so think about those things. So many of you have probably bought a car and as when you're buying a car, you do the usual work, you get uh, the details about the car, 2016, the mileage, it's above air, average condition, you do your research, Blue Book says here's the range of prices, fair to excellent on the quality of the car in terms of its condition. And the asking price is 21.5. Excuse me. <clears throat> Question. What's the first thing you think about? You've got your research. You've got the number. You've looked over the car. You kind of want to buy it. What's the first thing you're thinking about? Too high. They're asking too much. <clears throat> it's not within range. So you're probably already moving towards thinking about this. What is my counter offer, right? They're asking price. We know in car buying, there's a negotiation that goes on. So what is my counter offer going to be? Well, it's not going to be 21.5. It's going to be less than that. We got to start thinking about what that number is. I want you to hold that thought for a second. That is usually our first step. We go straight towards kind of the, uh, uh, what is my counter offer going to be? But I'm going to ask you to kind of think a little bit more about this situation before you go to the counter offer. What do I mean by that? Let me walk you through three steps in kind of a planning process. First of all, you have to think about your interest. Well, obviously you're interested in the car because you need a car, you're interested in that type of car, you like the car, uh, you need a second car, whatever the interests are. You understand why you're doing this. But what I'm gonna encourage you to do is think about what might be their interests. If it's a car dealer, what might be their interests, right? Uh, you know, Kathy points out, you know, my mileage might be too high. That's one of my interests. I want low mileage. I want a good price. I want it in good condition, all those things. But let's flip this for a second and not think about your interests. Think about the other party's interests. So if it's a dealer, what might be some of their interests besides the price? Absolutely, they're going to want a profit. They're going to make gain customers. So they want you maybe to come back and buy repeat customer buying, right? So maybe that would be one. Some may want a quick turnaround, get cars on and off the lot, make their commission. That's all about the money side. There's more interest that they might have in addition to, uh, as Beth pointed out, gain uh, oh, customers for service, right? Maybe they want you to come back for their services. By the way, services have more margins than the cars do. Things like that. So if you start thinking about uh, making their quota, great. So when you start thinking about all of their interests that they might have, here's what you've done. You've better positioned yourself for making your case for your particular counter offer because you might understand what they might be looking for and you can incorporate that into your proposal, okay? We're gonna talk more about kind of that sense of those interests, but my point here is think about your own interests, certainly, but think about what might be their interests and that will help you frame what you're gonna propose. Second thing, what's the relationship? If you're buying this car from your uncle or your aunt, that's a different conversation than if you're buying it from uh, a neighbor or someone you, uh, you saw in the newspaper, right? The ad was in the newspaper or the dealer. Maybe you want a relationship with your local dealer so you can have continuous service and uh, good, good prices on future cars. But you have to think about that relationship component as well. So what are their interests? What is the relationship between these two parties? What are my interests? How do I package and think about all, all of those things to then better position uh, my proposal, okay? We'll talk more about how you can understand their interests in a little bit. Figure out what you want, figure out your priorities. Do you want financing? Is that important to you? Do you want quick delivery? Right now cars, if they're new cars that are having uh, major delays on deliveries. Do you want uh, obviously a good price? Do you want the warranty? What are the things you want besides the price? Try to be clear about those things. So what might be their interests? What's the relationship? What are my interests? What are my priorities of all those interests? 
And then what am I going to do to kind of position myself? First of all, I'm going to do my homework. Yep, blue book and all that. But here's the thing that happens with a lot of uh, negotiators. They build a BATNA, which is their walk away. Probably many of you had already established a walk away price. I'm not going to pay 21.5 for that car. That's my, they give me that offer. They don't move. I'm not paying that price. I'm, that's my walk away. BATNA is called best alternative to no agreement. Here's what happens in negotiations though. BATNA starts to melt. What do I mean by melt? We walk in the door with a firm number or a firm idea about what we're gonna walk away with, uh, what that point is, and we melt it. We kind of start reconfiguring it or rethinking it. And by the way, that's often where car dealers will, will have you stay in, in, in their shop for a long period of time. It's a long conversation. They have to check with their manager. All that extends the amount of time you're committed to this task. Well, more time you've committed to the task, guess what happens? The more committed you are to the solution. The more committed you are to the solution, the less likely you are to walk away if you hit your walk away or batten a point. So that's where we see a lot of melt. So it's really important to be clear about your batten up. Now, if you had a, a job offer, but you had three other job offers, you got great batten up, right? I got three other great offers. But if this is the only job offer in the last three months, you don't have a strong batten up. So you want to think about what could be your bad note here. And then clarify your optimal outcome and your opening offer. My guess is your opening offer would be kind of towards your walkaway point, right? Uh, excuse me, the other end, be towards uh, your optimal number. Your optimal number and your opening offer would be similar. But be clear about this. This is important. But we also have to figure out what's that zone of space by which people are even going to negotiate in. If you come and say, oh, I'll tell you what, I'll pay you $10,000 for the car, unless you've got more information about their other interests, like they need to sell the car today, then they're likely to say no. And then you've just kind of wasted their time and your time. So you have to kind of figure out what that zone is, right? Well, so we have kind of a range that we work from, but that range can change once we understand more about the other person's interests. If I was the seller and I'm telling you, I've got to sell this car today. I got to sell it. I'm moving out of town tomorrow and I'm driving uh, 3,000 miles. Guess what? I'll probably take pretty much any price, right? So that's why it's important to think about those alternative uh, interests the person might have and start exploring that. We'll talk about how to expose that. So that's the planning process, okay? All right, thought exercise number two. You remember as a kid, uh, maybe you have a brother or sister, or, or maybe it was your cousin or your friend, and you walked into the kitchen and there was an orange or maybe a piece of cake, but there's only one, and you both grabbed it at the same time, and they both argued about it, and then what was your solution? You cut it in half, right? Seems like a logical solution. Everyone gets apart, and if you're like my family, you, the person cuts it, the other person gets to pick which piece. So you get the better piece, make sure there's no cheating, right? You've all probably done that. But here's uh, uh, Fel, uh, Mary Fellett, uh, a management uh, guru, talked about this and she said, what's really interesting to think about is we don't even understand why they want the orange. Now we kind of conclude, yeah, they want to eat it or they got a piece of cake, yeah, we want to eat that cake. But what we fail to do really is find out what do they really want? She tells a wonderful story about two siblings who wanted the same orange, but in fact, one wanted to, to juice uh, the orange for orange juice, and one wanted to kind of use the peel to bake a cake. So you know how you scrape off the, the edges of the, of the orange and they use the, the, that for the, the cake mix. Well, the reality is they could have both had the orange, right? One could have had the peel, one could have had the orange juice, but we tend to start with a key assumption that can hinder our, our negotiations. And that's this. Our assumption uh, is pretty much that the other party's gonna value the same outcomes as I do. Now, when we talk about money, yes, the price of the car, they're gonna want more money. I'm gonna want more money by saving money. So we start with this fixed pie approach. We also start with a major assumption that negotiations is a competition. I gotta win this, I gotta get the best possible price. But maybe I'd be willing to give on price if I could have better service or I could have better financing on the vehicle or whatever it might be. 
So the point here is this can be a real error in our starting point. So we start from this point, we really should try to kind of back off that if we can. So how do we do that? How do we get off uh, kind of this assumption? And now there are places and points in time where at the end of the day, it is a fixed pie, right? The cake with your, your brother or sister, that's a fixed pie or a fixed cake. There's only so much that's available. Same with salary, right? Someone's gonna have to give, someone's gonna lose on the salary negotiation in terms of dollars, that's fixed. But the other interest that the both parties might have may compensate for a giving in on those, uh, on those dimensions of that fixed uh, asset, if you will. So, but the problem is uh, negotiators and inexperienced negotiators versus expert negotiators, uh, you know, more expert negotiators don't start at this place. They start with a different place. So where do they start? They start with this idea of called creating value. It's kind of a mutual problem solving approach. Now you've all heard a win-win strategy or a win-win. Uh, I'm not a big fan of the win-win uh, kind of uh, language because it, it doesn't really do justice what's underlying that process. What's underlying the process here is, I'm gonna start this conversation with an assumption that they have a problem, I have a problem, I need a vehicle, they need to sell a vehicle, I, I, need, I, need, um, I need financing, they may be willing to offer financing because they, it benefits them, uh, I need good service, they wanna provide service, these are all the things I could think of, right? So the, the shift here is, how could I think about what are all those interests underlying my particular situation and their particular situation. And then how do I craft a solution that's gonna work for both sides? Well, if we're gonna shift from a competitive mindset to a mutual problem solving mindset, it requires a set of behaviors that are different, okay? When we're in competitive mode, what we're really trying to do is convince the other party that you're right and they're wrong, right? Think about any argument you've had with a spouse or a friend or, uh, roommate or, or, or uh, whomever it may be, your, your manager, your boss. I got to convince the other party that I am right on this particular solution. Let me repeat that. Competition, I am right on this particular solution. The creating value mindset is I've got to find solutions that are beneficial <clears throat> to all the interests that kind of as a whole, not any one of them, but as a whole is a good deal for me and hopefully a good deal for them, okay? So that's the mind shift. So how do we get to a creating value mindset? Uh, I'm gonna throw out three ideas. I like themes of three, right? <clears throat> Start with trying to find out more information, ask questions and more questions and more questions. Let's pause there for a second. I think of all the things that we're gonna talk about today, this is probably the most important. The more questions you ask about the situation and their situation, the more information you then have to package a solution that in an essence creates value for both sides, okay? So um, interestingly, research shows if you ask why questions, like why that, like why that price? Think about it. if I was to ask you why that price, you gave me an offer of $19,000 for that vehicle, I say, well, why that price? You would say, well, you'd start giving me your rationale, right? Well, the research shows the values are from this range to this range in terms of their, in terms of their condition. This car is in average condition or above average condition. Uh, comparable vehicles have similar prices of 19,000, 20,000, and that's what I landed on. So I give you a whole bunch of reasons that justify my solution. If I ask how and what questions, you're actually gonna have to start probing into my interests, right? So uh, tell me more about uh, your selling. <clears throat> and what else are you interested in terms of selling? Now, does it matter to you if I pick up the car on Saturday? Because in my interest, I need to pick up this car on Saturday. Uh, or, you know, you start asking those kinds of questions. Uh, and by doing so, the how and what questions actually give you more information than why questions. Now, I'm not saying you can't use why questions, please use them, but just try to use how and what questions as well, because that will really solicit from the other party information about their interests 
that you could then think about how do I package all of this as a proposal that satisfies uh, everyone's interest here. Share more. This is where uh, it can be challenging. Most of us tend to think when I'm negotiating, I keep everything close to the chest. All my cards are, are close to me. I don't share anything because that would be a disadvantage for me. Actually, um, if you're thinking about sharing ideas about your interests, about your even your priorities or what's more important to you, what you're doing is you're helping position the other party to also create solutions that'll help you. What you don't share is you don't share your BATNA. <clears throat> you don't want them to know what your kind of walk away point is. You don't share your costs. I bought this vehicle for this two months ago. You don't want to share those details because that would be the, the place that the other side's going to go to right away, right? But for the most part, try to share more, not less. And then look for other things that they might be interested in uh, outside of um, the particulars, okay? Um, so uh, think about it from all those perspectives uh, in terms of how we create value. So those three things help uh, kind of drive towards creating value. Questions on that? I, I just spent about uh, seven minutes, six, seven minutes talking without uh, communicating or getting uh, any chat or any questions. So any questions or any uh, thoughts? I do have a question. Please. This is Beth. Hi, Beth. Um, you're, I think, right, the assumption in this, um, in this how and why, the how and what, and then the, and sharing a little bit of your interest is that the assumption is that both parties have um, are, are being um, upfront or honest, right? Are fully disclosing um, their their honest interests. Um, in the example of the car dealership um, example, which I understand is just an example, but that's something that I personally have struggled with when negotiating for a vehicle because I often get the feeling that I'm being lied to and that they're not really, and that I don't, um, whatever they say their interests may be, that they're using them to manipulate me. Um, so I would presume then that under those kinds of circumstances where their goal is to perhaps tell you things that aren't their true interests, um, that a method like this would be um, perhaps not as effective. Great, great observation and comment. Thanks to you, Beth, for sharing that. Yeah, having similar experiences going to car dealers, not to uh, make comments about car dealers, many of them are great. But uh, the, the, your point is well taken. And that is, uh, there's, you're starting with a kind of an element of trust here, right? That they're gonna share and you're gonna share and there's gonna be mutual problem solving. Uh, absolutely the case that in fact, uh, you'll find many negotiators are not gonna wanna share. They're gonna hold it close to their chest, uh, right? They're gonna keep their cards to them. They're not gonna wanna answer questions uh, specifically because they're afraid that you will take advantage of them or vice versa. So your point's absolutely on, on, on point, Beth. Uh, I would I would try to argue you know it's uh, was it the Ronald Reagan uh, trust but verify uh, statement. Uh, my point to that is the only way you can kind of verify is simply to ask a whole lot more questions till you get comfortable saying yeah I think this is legit or you know what uh, they're just kind of giving me a bunch of, of uh, uh, things that they think I want to hear right. So the more questions you can ask, the more it'll kind of probe into that space. Uh, as long as you do it professionally and with, uh, you know, diplomacy, um, there's absolutely nothing wrong with asking more questions. And good questions to ask in those situations, like let's say, you know, you're trying to find out if the, if the car dealer uh, wants you to be an ongoing customer. Great. So then uh, you can follow up with a question. Well, talk to me a little bit about ongoing customers. What do you do for ongoing customers? What are the specific things that you do for them? You know, now I'm now I'm kind of probing and finding out, yeah, they're giving me a line or yeah, they actually have a pretty robust uh, customer focused uh, uh, program. So to your point, Beth, you're absolutely, it's a great point. Uh, I appreciate you bringing it because I'm sure many of you were thinking of it as well. But I, I would argue, just try to ask more of those questions, more of those probing questions to find out the, the truth behind the statements. Uh, to verify those things. So uh, well said. Uh, thank you, Beth, for sharing that. Uh, yeah, you know, do you, uh, gender dynamics play a part uh, in negotiations? That's a whole course one could teach. So I'm going to step aside from that. Not that it's not important, but simply because it's a whole a set of uh, interesting uh, uh, dynamics that play out. 
Thank you for sharing that. Others? All right. We're going to go to exercise number three. Now we're going to shift it from the more simple kind of negotiations to the more complex. Uh, for the sake of simplicity, I've broken down seven <clears throat> uh, issues uh, for a new job. I want you to, uh, on a piece of paper somewhere, rank order priorities, one through seven, salary, <clears throat> bonus, start date, move expense, insurance, job location. I also want you to pick the uh, select your outcome that you want. Now, some are going to be self-evident for everyone, but nonetheless, uh, please uh, just take a moment and do both of those things for me. Um, if we're good, then we'll move on. If we're not, throw up in chat to so say, hey, Jim, just give me another minute. Otherwise, we'll move forward. Okay, so there's seven items. I ask you to kind of rank order the items of importance to you, uh, given your current situation. Uh, and then also just like the outcome you wanted. So, all right. Uh, so you went through an interview. I'm the hiring manager. Uh, I've just, um, you kind of knew that these were kind of the outcomes, the potential outcomes. Uh, obviously there's a lot more that would go on in that process, but I'm gonna simplify it here for, uh, for purposes of uh, illustration. I'm gonna give you an offer. Here's your offer. Hundred thousand, twelve percent of salary for bonus, seventeen day, fifteen days vacation, starting one month. Moving expenses are forty five hundred. Uh, insurance, uh, you get to pick whichever one you want, and uh, job, uh, the job location is San Francisco. All right. So, given all that we have said so far, what's your next step? I think you start. I'm I'm looking at my I'm looking at your offer and my list and thinking about okay the things that are were the most important to me and my top three aren't the answers that I wanted so I'm going to start focusing on my top three and ignore the rest. All right, so I've got cost of living comparison, so that would be your research that would be doing your homework to see what's the difference between San Francisco versus the current location. See how much of that, Beth. Your top three items are none of them got to your uh, place for top three? Correct. Okay. Start date, uh, location, and vacation were my top three, and they are not where I want them to be. Okay. So you've identified where they're not. Uh, and then we got asked questions. Would you ask how important is the start date? So I assume the start date was important, right? Correct. So, uh, um, great. So. I like this answer in chat, which is yes, ask questions. In other words, you want to find out what my interests are here, right? So then you can then figure out how all this fits. Okay. So uh, Beth, since you've, you've uh, shared your, your priorities, which, what would be your next step? What questions might you ask me? So I would begin, since start date was my number one, I would begin by asking about um, sort of what are the drivers around um, the start date? Where, how much, you know, is there, is there a particular event or need, internal need that's driving the urgency around the start date? Because if I understand that, then I can understand whether I can, do I have anything to negotiate towards? Because if the answer is some drop dead thing that they can't give on, then I'm wasting my breath to, um, to negotiate on that. And maybe I drop down to my second item, which is location and negotiate that instead. So Beth, thank you for sharing that. And I'm gonna use your answer and just kind of expand upon it a little bit. So if I was answering the question, I may say, indeed, I'm kind of anxious to get people in, in, in the office because we've got a major project that's coming up. So we're really in a time squeeze to get that project going. And uh, three months out is way too much for, for us. Um, but I'm going to follow up with what you said. You just said drop to the next one. If this was important to you, I would argue what you want to do is you want to package that as something as you can then kind of trade off with. Well, you know, I really don't want to start in a month, but I could. But I really also need these things. So if it's so what you're doing is you're kind of trading off then my interest of I really need someone to start in a month with some other thing that would be beneficial to you that maybe I'm okay giving away, so to speak, or giving up on because it's not quite the priority, okay? 
But what you've done and what you're all doing here as you're thinking about this is you're asking me all these kinds of questions. Start date. Is it matter? Is it a month or in three months? I may, may have said, you know what? It's really not that important. It's just I'd like to get people going soon, but uh, you know, I'm okay if it's later, it doesn't matter, right? Okay, so uh, anyone have location in Chicago instead of San Francisco? <clears throat> or did everyone wanna to go to San Francisco? I had Chicago as well. All right, anyone else? Okay. Okay, well, Wayne, I think we've heard from you. Uh, well, share with us uh, why Chicago, not why Chicago, but what you would do if this is, was this a top priority for you? location? Um, yeah, actually it was. And um, I actually have lived in San Francisco previously and I haven't lived in Chicago. So that was part of the reason. Uh, and then also in my head, at least I had the cost of living kind of function because I've lived in San Francisco. And additionally, I've got, you know, maybe some family in the Midwest and it's a little harder to get them to come all the way out there. So for me, that was something I was thinking about. And so thinking about your like trade-off thing, one thing, you know, maybe I can't, maybe I want to start in three months, and I could, I could, you know, maybe be convinced to move back, right? But, um, but I could start in one month in Chicago. And you said you have this project, so, but I mean, maybe need, you know, maybe then I can negotiate on like the salary or something if I was looking for that one ten or the vacation days being higher or something like that by playing off of that. So, excellent. Thanks, Wayne, for sharing that. That's exactly right. So you're all getting the idea here is you have to find out what my interests are for each of these places, each of these particulars, or as many of these particulars as possible, right? You may find out through this conversation that actually moving expenses are not my problem that comes out of the HR budget, but salary and bonus come out of my budget, and that becomes a problem for me, right? Or you may find that, uh, you know, salary is just kind of the starting place. I'm very open because we got a full range of, of uh, salaries for this kind of position. Uh, and then obviously things like uh, our new ideas, instead of Chicago or San Francisco, what about working remotely or three days in the office or whatever that might be. So you're gonna start kind of digesting all of that by asking me a ton of questions to get what my interests are out on the table and then mixing those up in a way that's gonna be beneficial for me and for you, okay? That's kind of how we wanna think about this. Where people make mistakes in this uh, salary negotiation process is they go down the list. They start with their priority number one. They try to negotiate that. Let's say you, you land, let's say salary was number one and you said, oh, I'll tell you what. I say, well, how about 108? And you say, fine. Okay, guess what? You've already locked in that. You've limited yourself to negotiate on the other items. So you don't wanna lock in until you get the whole portfolio kind of packaged together, okay? So you could say, you know, that sounds pretty good. Let's go on and talk about this next one. The next one I wanna talk about is location. Uh, the next one I want to talk about is the vacation days or start date or whatever it is. So you start talking about each of these items, find out where I am on each of them, and then try to put together the package. That's kind of the key uh, process here. If you do that, you're actually creating value for both parties, right? So <clears throat> when you do that, what you find out is you're going to find out uh, the interests vary on a couple of dimensions. Some are inversely related. Generally, salary is inverse related. Employer wants to pay less, you want more. You're gonna find some of them are of equal value. Many, all of you wanted, or many of you want to go to San Francisco. I need someone in San Francisco. Guess what? It's a, it's a, it's a good deal for both of us, equal value. And then you're gonna find things that value uh, and vary in value. You notice that the uh, benefits were you get to choose. So as a hiring agent, I don't care which employee uh, benefit package you choose, that's up to you, it doesn't cost me anything. It is zero interest to me, but maybe it's an important interest to you. You find out it's zero interest to me, important to you, you can lock in whatever you want, take that off the table and then negotiate on the other ones. So the point is, think of it as this portfolio of interests that you're trying to merge between the two parties and together to make a reasonable solution that, um, finds value for everyone. Does that make sense? So try not to go down the list and, and check off the box and lock people in until you kind of get the whole portfolio done. Uh, and please try to find out what the other party's interests really are because that will help in that process. So, and the research is real consistent here. Effective or uh, expert negotiators ask a ton more questions than those who are not as good or not as versed in negotiations. 
So if there's anything to kind of take away from this, there's nothing wrong with asking a ton of questions, even going back and revisiting questions that you've asked before to, to confirm. Uh, the more you ask those questions, the more you understand what I want as the, as the, the party you're negotiating with, and the more you can align these, part, these parts of interest together. And you're also gonna find out what my priorities are, what outcomes I really desire more than others, and you're gonna have this kind of agreeable portfolio for everyone. So that's kind of the, kind of the, the, the mix there that helps uh, create uh, more meaningful solutions for everyone. Okay, I'm gonna stop there. Uh, and uh, I wanna uh, just ask uh, what questions might you have about anything? Uh, I'll start with one that I often get was from uh, folks, which is, <clears throat> is it okay to kind of, um, uh, I won't say lie, but kind of bend the truth a little bit or kind of hedge uh, my answers in a way that's somewhat disingenuous. Uh, I don't know how to answer that question. It's a question I get often, but because we, we fear it in negotiations. So I understand why we ask that question. We fear it of the other. And we're also thinking of the mindset of competition. I gotta win. So if you take away the mindset of competition and don't start there, let's start with kind of a create solution, creative solution approach, and then move towards the competition uh, if you need to. Uh, that's one way to kind of avoid that challenge. Uh, but as you get that question, um, other questions you all might have that I can be helpful with. I can tell you what, uh, what it all has to say. Takeaways. The more you do your homework and the stronger your BATNA is, the better off you will be. The more you understand, and oftentimes when we negotiate, like let's say go back to the car or a house, the less we understand about what we're buying, the more difficult we have in the negotiation process because we don't know what the landscape is. The stronger your BATNA is, <clears throat> so sometimes you have to be creative to think about what your BATNA could be, right? And you're anxious to start a new job you're, for whatever reason, you can say, well, my bad is, what if I don't have a job for a month or two more versus taking one I don't like? You know, what are my options? Really kind of explore and be creative in the, that badness space. Obviously, if you have really strong badness, I've got four job offers, um, but this is the job I want. You can certainly use those to leverage for your negotiations, right? So try to start with the creating value mindset, learn, share, and, and, and think out new solutions. There are times, let me repeat, there are times where you're gonna to have to go to the distributive negotiation, which is basically the only issue we have on the table is price. There's no other interest I'm interested in, you're interested in, there's nothing there, it's just price, okay? Then you're gonna to have to kind of be a little bit more of a kind of competitive approach to your negotiation versus kind of a great value by itself. Ask questions, ask more questions, try to incorporate the how and what questions besides the why question. And then please remember all negotiations at the end of the day fall into kind of this emotional space. <clears throat> am, I, am I being treated fairly? Have they reciprocated because I reciprocated? How do I feel about this decision? That's, so those are all emotions that play into the negotiation. Which by the way, real effective negotiators can use your emotions uh, in the negotiation process. So you have to be sensitive to understanding that, hey, they're playing on my emotions on this one, you know, so, so be it. <clears throat> I have a colleague who did employee negotiations. Uh, he was with the management, but he negotiated for many years with unions. And one of his negotiations um, got heated and they were arguing and uh, the other party on the other side started calling him names and calling his mother all kinds of names and he stopped and said, you know what, at the end of the day, this isn't about me, it's not about my mother, it's about these items. So you try to bring it back into the space. My point is the emotions can get high sometimes in negotiations as well. So try to keep your emotions in check, understand where they're coming from, and also understand the other party's negotiations. All right, other questions? Um, this is probably an odd one, but I do have a question. Yeah, please ask. Are there... Um, understood or known, documented, pick your adjective, um, techniques around, um, um, let's say, prodding someone emotionally, in other words, doing something to make them angry purposefully in order to that feed into somehow winning 
in negotiation? Are there, are there, um, I don't know, are there known things around that? In other words, you, the, the other party saying something to make you angry mm -hmm. in order to gain some leverage or some control of some kind? Yeah, so there are, there's, there's a whole litany of kind of behaviors that people can try to exhibit. Uh, the example I just gave you from my colleague, you know, calling people names is trying to get their emotions up so that they're not thinking clearly about something, right? Uh, certainly you find uh, the, often in negotiations, you'll find the other party trying to convince you that you want to do this because, you know, it's uh, keeping up with the Joneses kind of thing, right? In terms of um, whether it's buying a house or, you know, whatever that might be, um, playing into the emotions of, if, let's say you're buying a house, playing into the emotions about well, what's so great about this neighborhood, you know, so that you feel real positive about uh, where you're going in addition to the house that you're buying. So yes, yeah, certainly it all, it, absolutely negotiations uh, uses uh, a, a play on emotions in a number of different ways, depending on the context and the particulars, as well as how well that person responds to those things, right? If you're, if you're talking a lot about, you know, your enthusiasm and excitement about moving into this neighborhood, if I'm selling you the house, I'm going to talk about all the good things about the neighborhood because you're telling me you're excited about that, right? So, but if you're, but if it's um, inconsequential to you, uh, then, you know, I can't really use that as a leverage. So yeah, there, absolutely the motions will be used as a leverage. My point is try to understand if it's being used and how it's affecting your emotions. Just so you understand. Uh, and by the way, that is an interest for why you buy a house, right? The certain neighborhood, the certain schools or a certain uh, location for traffic or access to the train or whatever it is. So it's not inconsequential to your interests, but sometimes it's played um, above and beyond just that particular interest. So hopefully that helped out. Yeah. Thank you. Also, do you have any, um, do you have a, like a go-to book or a reference that you um, often use or offer to people, something to, you know, to read and learn more about these? Yeah, so um, I have a, a resource cited here. I didn't cite it at the end, I apologize, but I cited it in one of the slides. Um, um, and it's, uh, uh, the name is Voss. Uh, um, and it's called Never Split the Difference. And it's actually in the slides. So I'll stop sharing. Um, and I've got it. I'll find it on Amazon. Thank you. Yep. Uh, but it, what's really good about that particular uh, book is he's actually a professional. He's spent his whole life negotiating uh, like terrorists and uh, all those things. So he has a really interesting. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, that was quick. Uh, so he has a really interesting kind of perspective, but he also teaches at a university, uh, Georgetown, at least the last I saw, he's teaching at Georgetown. So he has the, the research behind his uh, ideas that he shares. So it's a good book. It's probably, uh, it's, an, it's a fun read too, because he tells interesting stories about uh, hair raising experiences and negotiations. So I'll, thank I'll, you, Kathy, for sending that along. I'll, men I'll also mention he, Bob Voss, uh, or Chris Voss rather, he actually, he spoke at Google uh, and I, I've watched it. It's like an hour or more. And, uh, and he, you know, gave a talk there and, and he's, there's a few different things he's recorded that are, they're pretty fascinating. Like you said, his background is really amazing. Uh, and so he's got just shocking stories basically uh, through his career. So that's, those are worth checking out too. Thanks for sharing that Wayne. Yeah, he does on YouTube. You'll find a, a, a few of his videos. He also has, what is that? Uh, there's now a, a, an app you can buy where you can get master classes. Uh, he's one of the master class teachers for negotiations. So yeah, thanks for sharing that. All right, great. All right, we've got about a couple more minutes. There's anything else, any questions I can answer? Uh, feel free to send me an email if you have something that follows up. I, I do want to point out to someone coming at the end in chat. Um, yeah, negotiations is, is is for, for many of us, myself included, is not easy because it's stressful. Um, you know, it's like, am I doing the right thing? Am I making the right decision? We want it to be incredibly rational uh, and make the best decision possible. You gotta have to kind of recognize that those are your emotions at the moment and just try to shift to focusing on getting the information on the interests uh, that they have and you have and try to put those together. 
Well, our time is up. Uh, thank you, Kathy, once again, master class. There you go. Uh, awesome. Um, so, uh, but again, please send me any emails if I could be of any assistance. I really enjoyed the time and uh, wish you all a happy 4th of July. Hopefully it's a fun one and hopefully a little bit cooler. Uh, here anyway. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm just gonna say as soon as the recording is available, I will send the link out along with a copy of the slides from today. So thank you all for registering and hope we see you at our next one on July. 13th, I believe we won't want we won't have one next week, but it will be on um, financial fitness with Sue McGinty.